Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church for Sunday, October 6. We are still in Unit 2 of the Fall Quarter, or we're beginning Unit 2, I should say, for the Fall Quarter. And it is entitled, Responses to God's Faithfulness. Responses to God's Faithfulness. If you remember uh, Unit 1, in Unit 1, our title was... God is faithful. God is faithful. And now we are going to be <clears throat> going through a series of lessons that remind us or that demonstrate ra rather the responses to God's faithfulness in the Word. Our devotional reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 to 12. Uh, our background scripture it's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 14, and then chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. Our printed passage is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, and then 12 and 13. From the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, the lesson title is Do As You Are Told. Do As You Are Told. And the lesson aims or... Number one, summarize God's responses, I'm sorry, summarize God's reasons for why the people should obey the commandments. Number two, experience all at the majesty of God who gave these commandments. And then number three, commit to faithfulness to God through the new covenant, just as the Israelites were to be faithful in the old covenant. After the introduction, the lesson outline has three major divisions. The first is titled, Obey and Live. Obey and Live, and that's covered between Deuteronomy 4, verses 1 to 4. The second is, Obey and Attract. And that's covered between chapter 4, verses 5 and 8. And the third is, Don't Forget. Don't forget, and that's covered between chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. From the, from the standard commentary, our lesson title is Obedient Faith. Obedient Faith. And additional aims from the standard are, number one, list Moses' reasons for, for obeying God's command or commandments. Number two, explain the importance of the Ten Commandments for the New Testament era. And then number three, plan one way to obey God more fully in the week ahead. Now if you'll recall, in last week's lesson, our lesson uh, text was taken from Numbers chapter 14. Uh, we learned about the uh, consequences or the fallout following the evil report that 10 of the 12 spies that went in to spy out the land of Canaan came back to the children of Israel with. Uh, God, if you recall, God uh, uh, talking to, to Moses, he appeared just as the people were uh, contemplating stoning Joshua and Caleb and his glory appeared in the tabernacle. And he spoke to Moses and said he will destroy the people and make a great nation of Moses. And of course, you remember the intercessory or the intercession that Moses offered, and ultimately God pardoned the people. However, uh, there were consequences to their unfaithfulness, to their disbelief, and that followed where we left off at chapter uh, 14, verse 20, when God actually pronounced that they were going to wander in the wilderness. For 40 years and all those that were 20 years old and older would die in the wilderness because of their unfaithfulness and he would take their children uh, in the one whom they thought would be prey to the Canaanites uh, to possess the land. And so fast forward 40 years to our lesson uh, where our lesson picks up today. Uh, and let me back up and say Deuteronomy, we are... Uh, our lesson is taken from the uh, from the last book of the 
Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible. And Deuteronomy means really a second law, a second law. And it's, it's, it's really a mistranslation uh, in the Septuagint of the Greek. Uh, it does not mean a different law. That suggests that it's a different law, but it's basically a repeating of the law that God gave in Exodus and Leviticus. And Moses is repeating this law for this new generation uh, that is about to go in to possess the land. Uh, those that were uh, alive uh, uh, when uh, he turned the children of Israel back into the wilderness or somewhere between 40 and 60 years old. And of course, there uh, were no doubt many children that were born in the wilderness and they are younger than 40 years old. So they don't know. They have not heard this law before. Uh, Moses uh, did uh, teach the older generation, the, the adult generation that came out of Egypt, these laws. And, and if you've read both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you see that Deuteronomy is a, basically a repetition of, of Leviticus, of the laws given in Leviticus, but it's for a new generation that is about to go in to possess the land. Uh, and the, in fact, even the Ten Commandments are repeated in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy. So in the first three chapters of Deuteronomy, Moses has uh, reminded this younger generation of what happened some 40 years ago. Uh, he, he reminded them of how the children appeared before uh, Horeb, or the Mount of Sinai, uh, and how the Lord had uh, uh, appeared to the people of Israel. We're going to read more about that in our lesson text. Uh, in, in voice, actually, they heard his voice. Uh, he talks about the spies in chapter 1 that went in to spy out the land. And as we said yesterday, uh, the, it was really the people's idea to send the spies in. And, and, and God went along, Moses as well, went along with sending the spies. And he chose out a man uh, of good report from each tribe. Um, then uh, we read about how God because of their uh, rebellion, because of their unfaithfulness, uh, he turned them back into the wilderness. And uh, while he pardoned them by leaving them alive and not making a new nation of Moses' descendants, uh, then there were consequences for their unbelief, just as there are in ours today. Uh, then we see there are battles that they have, uh, this new generation. Uh, they defeat... Uh, Cylon and they defeat uh, Og and and then they settle on the east side of the Jordan and uh, we know there are a couple of tribes uh, two and a half tribes that want to uh, stay on that side of Jordan after they conquer Canaanite after the land of Canaan uh, and that was uh, the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay on the east side of Jordan. And if you've read through the Old Testament, you know that uh, later uh, they actually are forced to uh, come over Jordan and possess a land uh, in the land of Canaan as well. And uh, when we pick up uh, in uh, chapter 4 then, uh, Moses turns his focus to uh, the importance of obeying God's law. I mean, before he gets into the details of the law, which he does throughout the remainder of the book, and, and particularly in uh, verses, uh, chapters rather, uh, 28 to 31, where he pronounces the blessings and the curses. Um, blessings, certainly, if they remain obedient to God's law and faithful worship to him, and curses if they do not. Uh, he is beginning by making three arguments uh, as to why they need to obey God's law. So we're going to uh, pick up uh, with our lesson text. Actually, I'm going to read through the text uh, 
and then we will have some verse-by-verse -verse discussion. But before we do that, let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And Lord, we pray that you'd give us a clear understanding of your word, Lord, even this historical narrative, Lord, which you've told us we can learn by example uh, what we should do and how we should regard obedience to your word, Lord. We just pray that you would help us to be more obedient, more faithful, and Lord, increase our faith, Lord, day by day, Lord, as we walk in this sin sick and dying world, Lord. We thank you for all those who are here, who are listening, Lord, and we pray for them and that you'd meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We pray. Amen. So let's read through our text. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statues and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, or Baal at Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great people is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is, in all things that we call upon him for. And what nation is there so near that hath statues and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? And then skipping over to verse 12 and 13. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude. Only ye heard a voice, and he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments, and ye, he wrote them upon two tablets of stone. And our key verse is verse 4b, which is, Keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And we recall that Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I often hear uh, people pray and, um, and, and in their prayers talk about how much uh, they love the Lord. Uh, and, and I wonder, uh, are, they, are they demonstrating that uh, by obedience, by their obedience to him? And I, I challenge myself with that always as well. Uh, am I demonstrating true love for the Lord by being obedient to his word? And I think we should all do that, challenge ourselves with that. The Faith Pathway <clears throat> um, adult quarterly commentator uh, begins his introduction by talking about uh, baby boomers, of which I am one, um, being familiar with the old school term, um, do what you're told. Do what you're told, and we do remember that from our, our youngest uh, ages, uh, and we were not always told why we were to do what we were told, and quite honestly, we probably couldn't understand when we were younger. But as we grew, uh, we, we, we learned, we came to understand that the reason we were told simply to do as we were told was for our good, was for our protection, was for our benefit. And of course, we that have raised children uh, in like manner told our children the same, even before they could understand why. Uh, 
And certainly, uh, we who are growing in our maturity in the faith understand that all that God has commanded us to do is for our good and certainly for his glory. And our gl his glory uh, is reflected in us and through us by our obedience. And that's uh, Jesus commanded us to let our light so shine that men would see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And as the commentator says uh, further in the lesson, uh, our light um, shines most brightly when we are obedient to God and we're showing that obedience to the world. So let's get into our lesson text. Verse 1. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statues and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Now, first of all, this word now really connects what Moses is beginning to say, his exhortation here, with what he's already said in chapters 1 to 3. And uh, uh, so... He has reviewed their history. Uh, he's let the, this generation know how they got to where they are. Uh, he's reviewed the faith, uh, the faithlessness, 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, uh, and, and why they did that and so forth. And so he's saying now, uh, as a result of or because of this, he's going on. He's saying, hearken. Hearken means to listen, to listen and to respond to properly. Uh, and he's, he's saying unto the statues and judgments. Statues uh, refers to laws given by uh, typically a king that prescribe boundaries for his subjects to observe. We have statues today uh, in our states and, and certainly federal statues that really restrict us or determine the boundaries of our behavior uh, in certain areas of our lives. Uh, judgments refers to laws based on historical precedent, uh, what we call case law, you know, and uh, Moses actually combines them both to demonstrate that they are to observe the totality of God's law, of God, what God has revealed to Israel to do uh, and to practice, to restrict or restrain themselves from doing, and certainly to practice. Verse 2, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now, this is really a, uh, a phrase, if you will, or statement that's made uh, in several places. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, Jeremiah 26 and 2. And uh, the commentator, Sander commentator, calls this Moses' tamper-proof clause. Uh, and basically, it is restricting any alterations of the law. They're not to add to it. They're not to diminish it. Uh, we see this also, and I think the last place we see it is in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, where the uh, those the hearers of the revelation are uh, sternly, warned not to add or subtract anything from what is written in the book or it would be anathema it would be a curse upon them so uh, if a king issues a law it is not to be altered it is not to be it's only to be interpreted one way and that's the the way the giver of the law interprets it and Moses is God's uh, God is delivering or has delivered his word to the children of Israel through Moses. And the only interpretation that they are to receive and understand is the one that Moses provides for them. So they're not to change it. 
misinterpreted uh, as many uh, in our society do today. Uh, we know that there are many cults and isms that take uh, verses and passages out of context and uh, and really make a pretext out of them for a whole faith, a new faith system. Uh, I know of one very well-known um, popular uh, evangelist, televangelist, that takes a verse out of Romans chapter 4 uh, and basically says that uh, we can call those things that are not as though they are when the verse clearly says that God can call those things that are not as though they are. So uh, this is, I think this tamper-proof clause extends to a willful misinterpretations, not, not only literally adding verbiage or changing verbiage, but misinterpretations of God's word as well. Verse 3, your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor, for all the men that follow Baal Peor, the Lord thy God hath destroyed them from among you. Now, if you read that verse in the NIV, you get a clear rendering of it. And it says, you saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Bel Peor. And really, it's Bel of Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. The Baal was a god uh, of, of the heathen god, and it was at Peor where uh, several of the, uh, many of the uh, Israelite men uh, went on to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the women uh, of, uh, of Peor, of, of the Canaanite women, and uh, indulged in sexual immorality. And, of course, uh, this was basically in Moab. And, of course, God commanded that they be executed. And he sent men uh, among them to execute all those who had worshipped the Baal. These Moabite women had gotten the men to worship the Baal at Peor. And so they were destroyed as a result of disobedience to God's word. The first commandment said that he was the Lord thy God. There shall have no other gods before them. And so they were disobedient to God's word and destroyed as a result of that. And so Moses is setting first before them the consequence of disobedience to God's word. And it is death. And today, the consequence of disobedience to God's word, today when you hear his voice, harden out your heart. So, um, again, Moses is making the clear connection between obedience to God and uh, punishment or judgment. Uh, and I was saying, just as we uh, suffer uh, ultimately uh, with eternal separation from God, uh, and damnation uh, when we refuse to uh, accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior. Uh, and we know that God is going to judge the world one day by that one man, that's Jesus Christ, what we did with him. And so the greatest commandment is obviously to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And certainly we can, on, we can only do that uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ as we accept him as our Lord and Savior. So, uh, so that's one example that God gives them, uh, I mean, sorry, Moses gives them, uh, there are many uh, examples of how God judges uh, his people for uh, faithlessness and for disobedience in, uh, in his word. Verse 4, but ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you this day. Now, he's making the connection between obedience and blessing. They are there. They are poised to go in to possess the land that the Lord had given them and promised their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because they did not succumb to this temptation to worship other gods and to indulge in sexual immorality with the women of Moabite, of the Moabite women. Uh, so th this is really the first thing that uh, 
Moses, the first argument, if you will, that Moses is presenting as the reason for being obedient to God's word. Obedience leads to life and prosperity. Disobedience leads, leads to death, leads to destruction, leads to ultimately, again, uh, to eternal separation from God. If we're disobedient throughout our lives to God's call to accept what his son did on the cross for us. Verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whether ye go to possess it. So Moses is reminding again this younger generation that's about to go in to possess the land that he had taught them actually he had taught their adult parents and those that were old enough that are among them to hear and understand he taught them before in Exodus and Deuteronomy I'm sorry Leviticus rather these same statutes and judgments again the entirety of God's word uh, and uh, he later adds uh, commandments to that. So he's really wanting to um, wanting them to understand that he's taught them the entirety of what God has presented to him. And he has done that in obedience to God. He himself has been obedient to teach the people as God has commanded him to do. And so and he's reminding them uh, that he did that. So that they would have this law in the land that God had given them, that they were about to go in and possess. Verse uh, six. And I, let me before I go to verse six. Um, you know, those of you who who are real students of the Bible and you studied it, you know that that God repeats Himself a lot in the Bible and he he does that of course for effect uh, to demonstrate the importance uh, he says things over and over that we would eventually understand the importance and urgency of whatever he is uh, repeating and we see that here we'll see it elsewhere uh, throughout uh, really throughout this this book of, uh, of Deuteronomy and then uh, Again, verse 6 says, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Now, first of all, I mean, James tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. They're not just to hear Moses recite these words. But they're to hearken, they're to heed, they're to hear them, understand them, and then be obedient to them. They're to obey, they're to respond in proper manner to what Moses is going to teach them. And and then in doing so, what are they doing? This He said, this is your wisdom and your understanding, your true wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all nations. And the Faith Pathway commentator says, uh, obedience of the Israelites to God's commandment was not only a divine expectation, but also a means of evangelism. Now, this is the second argument that Moses is making for obedience to God, for why they should be obedient to God's word. They will be the light that God intended for his people to be to the Gentiles. They will be. We will be uh, a city on a hill uh, 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 that, that 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 cannot be hid, of course. And we will be uh, the, the 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 salt and the light that He's called us as Christians to be, and to let our and when He commanded us to let our good works, let our light so shine that men would see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We would be that for others to see, for unbelievers to see. And then he goes on to uh, explain what the unbelievers, what their reaction would be to God's people's obedience to his word. You know, let me just read that from the NIV. It says, observe them carefully. 
For this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about these decrees and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. They are wise and understanding because they have the wisdom and understanding of God in what they do and, 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 and how they are prospering as a result of that. They will see that as well. And, I, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that obedience to God always leads to the worldly, the, the, the prosperity that the world recognizes as prosperity, uh, wealth, and, and, and happiness. But they uh, generally it does. And secondly, uh, they are successful and prosperous with God regardless of their their physical, uh, what, what's happening uh, physically uh, to them and whether and whether God is allowing them to endure trials as they are being obedient. Let's move on to verse 7. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we have call, that we call upon him for? Let me read that from the NIV. What other nation is so great as to have their gods so near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? Now, in our last lesson, you recall that uh, when Moses was interceding for the nation of Israel, he said that the Egyptians will hear that you, you were not able to bring these people into the land of Canaan, so you destroyed them in the wilderness. And they'll tell the other nations, the Canaanites, and the Canaanites uh, know that you've been among them and that you've talked to them face to face and so forth, and which spoke of the intimate relationship that God had with his people. He was leading them daily uh, through the wilderness. He talked about the pillar of the, uh, the cloud uh, by day and the pillar of the fire by night and how he fed them and so forth. And so they, God has demonstrated his nearness to his people, his responding to their their cry, even their murmuring, uh, which God did not like, but he responded with with food and with water and with uh, with quail even uh, when they when they uh, got uh, tired of the manna, and so uh, they he is Moses is telling them how the people are going to react to their obedience. They're going to see God among them, that God is near them, that God is attentive to them, not like the false, dead, and dumb idols that they worship. This is a God that is responsive to them and that and that is with them, clearly with them, and they are demonstrating uh, obedience to him that is winsome, uh, that's attractive uh, to uh, the heathen. So again, the second argument is, they will be really evangelists to the uh, the nations around them who don't know the Lord. Their obedience will reflect that God is near them, uh, and that and and that He is responsive to them, and He is blessing them because of their obedience. And we need to understand now um, the the children of Israel are under what is commonly called the Mosaic Covenant, and is a, it's a conditional covenant. They are about to possess the land on the condition, and stay in the land and prosper in the land on the condition that they will be faithful to God's word. And if we move all the way over to, again, Deuteronomy chapters 28 to 31, we see how God tells them clearly how he will bless them and bless the fruit of their loins and bless their going in and their coming out and their crops and all of that if they're obedient to him and how he will curse them if they are disobedient and, and, and fall down and worship and go whoring after other gods and so forth. Let's move on to verse 8. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as this law which I set before you this day? Now again, um, the... The law that God uh, has given them is something that is going to make them uh, model citizens and a model nation for the world. Uh, in fact, God intended for his people to be 
uh, a witness uh, to be uh, his ambassadors to the world, just as he intends for us to be. Uh, and so the people will marvel at the the, the wisdom and the uh, in the statues and the judgments, and and no doubt recognize that they're not of man. You know, uh, we said earlier, uh, we, we we read earlier uh, about that uh, that clause uh, that. Uh, that tamper-proof clause that said the statutes shall not be changed, shall not be added to or taken away from. And I recall what one of the commentators said about the, uh, the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution was basically drafted in 1787, and then uh, it was recognized then that some provision had to be made for amendments to the Constitution. Because uh, obviously we're living, we're human, and we're changing, and so some provision had to be, and they recognized that they didn't have all knowledge, and they could not put something down that was going to stand for all time and eternity. So uh, there have been, excuse me, amendments to the Constitution, Uh, and I was amazed to learn that there have been over 11,000 proposed amendments over 11,000 proposed amendments in 1787. However, there are only 27 amendments. So the amendments are few and far between because, uh, you know, the the law is a, is a standard, should be a standard. Uh, it should be something that uh, governs or determines, rather, uh, the rightness, the correctness, or incorrectness of our of our behavior and our human interaction. Uh, now, the Constitution, of course, is made by man, and it and it necessarily needs to be changed and updated as required. But God's word is immutable; it changes not. And the people um, around recognize that these judgments, and we'll see here this uh, further in a minute. God wants. I'm sorry, no, through Moses, Moses wants the people to understand the author of the word, the provider of the word. It is not of human origin. It is of God, which makes it perfect. And so that leads us to the third argument for why the children of Israel should be obedient uh, to God. And actually, our lesson text does not include verses 9 through 11, but in verses 9 through 11, Moses reminds the people how, uh, and he's talking about their parents and those who were old enough to remember, how they stood before the Mount of of Horeb or the Mount Sinai, if you will, and when the Lord uh, manifests himself in, in fire and a thick, dark cloud, and he spoke to them out of the fire, and they were horrified, and God did that of course, to invoke uh, a reverent fear uh, of, that would produce obedience. And, uh, of course, the people didn't want uh, to hear from God directly. They wanted God to speak to Moses and Moses to speak to them. But he reminded them of that. And, he, and God spoke his covenant, his Ten Commandments to them. He gave it. Moses did not uh, produce this law, but God did. And he said, you heard, we'll see this in a minute, you heard a voice, but you didn't see a body. So it was obviously from God. This word came from God. So verse 12 says, And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words But you saw no similitude, only heard the voice. Again, he's talking about uh, God uh, uh, speaking to them from Mount Sinai and really uh, demonstrating his holiness. If you recall, no one was to approach the mountain or they would would be killed. Uh, But they heard this voice and it was thunderous and it was it was terrifying. It was dreadful. And they thought they would die just just by hearing his word and hearing his the commandments that God pronounced and knowing that they were guilty of the things that God was forbidding in his commandments. And then finally, uh, 13, let's look at 13a. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even 10 commandments, the Decalogue. Now, 
we know that the Ten Commandments were a summary of the law. There were more than 600 specific laws given to Moses, laws concerning uh, our interactions, our human interactions, and certainly how he was to be worshipped and how he was to be sacrificed to and so forth, but certainly other laws concerning our human interactions. And But they were summarized. They all had their origin in the Ten Commandments. And, and then the Lord... Jesus further reduced or summarized, if you will, the Ten Commandments into two laws. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that was the first commandment and basically summarized the first four of the Ten Commandments. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that summarized the second or the remaining six commandments of the Ten. And so... Um, Again, the, the, the point is, God gave the covenant. God gave the law, and not Moses. Moses is just being, has just been obedient to God in presenting or giving the law to the people. And then part B of 13 says, and he wrote them on tables of stone. Moses didn't even write them. Uh, God wrote them with, with the finger, with his finger. He wrote the Ten Commandments. So again, the third argument is these laws are not of Moses, they're not of man, they are directly given to us of God. All, all scriptures by inspiration of God is God breathed, and we should recognize that. And as we study, let's remember that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and certainly he is the author, and he is the greatest interpreter of the law. We can read all kinds of commentaries, and certainly some are good and some are better than others. Uh, but the greatest interpreter of God's word is his word. And, uh, and so we want to remember, and certainly we want to pray for understanding of God's word, even before we open the book, open the Bible. We want to pray that God would give us understanding, the correct interpretation, and then, of course, guide us in applying his word uh, after we have the correct interpretation to our lives. There are many applications of God's word once we get the correct interpretation of God's word. So we hope that uh, we have understood, uh, again, the importance of being faithful to God's word. Certainly, uh, he expects us as Christians to observe the Ten Commandments, the commandments, uh, all the ceremonial laws that were given to uh, the children of Israel, most of those have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, but certainly all the uh, the laws respect uh, honoring him and, uh, and and recognize him as the only God and uh, and certainly we we don't worship statues or or physical idols, but we can make many other things idols in our lives. We can make any many other things graven images in our lives, our work our 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 hobbies, our our money, or or whatever, our wives or loved ones, we, we we're to put nothing before God, and certainly God wants us to uh, love others as ourselves. And if we love others as we love ourselves, we will not steal from them, we will not commit adultery, we will not uh, lie, we will not do many of the things that are so, so common in our society today. So again, we hope that we have understood the importance of obeying God's law, and actually receiving uh, the blessings that result from obeying God's law. And, and uh, we pray that, uh, uh, that God will continue to give us uh, a, uh, a recognition uh, uh, of when we, uh, we are not in obedience and to, and to cause to move us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you move us to quickly confess our sins and forsake our sins and to restore fellowship with us as you've given us provision for in the first John chapter one, verses eight and nine. So may, may God keep you. May God bless you in Jesus name. Amen.